Ah, uh, there we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Vagabond Dog Industry Chats. This week, we have infamous journalist, uh, longtime games media luminary, Jonathan Holmes, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> How's it going? That was amazing. That, 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 that was, I guess, all true. And I, it's going it is. great. I, I, I don't think about myself much. Bored with myself. I'm old. Not interested in me. It's, I've done me. Thought about it. Uh, moved on. But you just made me interested in me. That was an amazing job. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think, I think the uh, the respect comes with the age. You know, you, you, hmm. it doesn't. I mean, I mean, hey, no, not saying this is the, specifically the case, but it doesn't matter how good you are at something if you do it long enough, people gotta pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely true there's there's two ways to make it in games journalism and in, in games in general and you, you know this you either just saturate like bananas and fill people with opportunities to to know who you are and eventually one of them catches you just go like all out in a blitz and just non-stop self-promote and make 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 stuff or you just spread that amount of stuff you make over time and eventually it catches up and you, you end up getting to work, even though, you know, maybe I'm not that great. I don't think if I started today, I couldn't get a job. Games right. Journalist, games blogging, no way. Way too competitive. Way too many people that are just way better than me. But because I've been around and I've built something of an audience over 12 years or something, they, they let me do stuff because I know people will pay attention to it to some degree. So, so yeah, stuck with it. It's been right. worth it. It's been a lot of fun. And so, uh, over those years, you have been a, a journalist, a podcaster, a community figure, and and, and more. Um, Jonathan has written for or worked for Destructoid. Uh, he writes for Nintendo Force, uh, which is a print magazine. Um, you've done a ton of independent projects, including a nearly two hundred episode run of uh, Sup Homes, which is uh, All right. uh, a, 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 a tremendous uh, a interview program that we. Uh, we were on way back in like, God, it must have been 2015? Uh, 14, maybe. 13, uh, maybe. 14? Yeah, uh, but yeah. probably for 2014 then. Um, and now you have a new podcast uh, talking to women about video games. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's, uh, it's a name that could definitely be mis misunderstood, but so far so good uh, on it. It's based on a YouTube show I did 2010 after I had stopped doing the Structoid show, which was sort of a, a big deal show on YouTube before mm -hmm. PewDiePie and kind of YouTube has formed into the, the, the business that it is for a particular type of content back when folks thought, well, we could, we could take the way TV is done and put it on YouTube. So all the, the guys who made, G4 and, and um, Attack of the Show and all that, they decided to form their own YouTube channel and, and video streaming uh, content house called Revision, Revision 3. Revision 3, yeah. And it was like their third company they made or something. And um, I hosted a show for them for a little bit and made like $300 in three months. Like the, 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 the little amount of money we made was... was insane but they had a giant loft studio in san mm -hmm. francisco and like interns and assistants and there was people on salary that were getting paid super well but they were kind of the the outside outside folks who um they they sort of wanted to pay but expected us to get paid elsewhere and we we kind of did but not really so quit that because that wasn't gonna keep me alive right. so i just started making my own kind of youtube content and actually did a little better with the talking to women about video games show than the destructoid show did in, in some ways what showed me what what works on youtube and what doesn't tv in, right. in youtube form that's that's not why people go to youtube to watch, watch traditional tv they want something like what you do and the kind of games you make that are made by people who aren't following that particular blueprint and are, are trying to give you something more every man or every woman or right. more you, honest. You can still that. smell so. this the stink of the human on it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, so I made a show that sort of made fun of myself and made fun of 
Ames culture, but also tried to say something hopefully interesting about games at the same time. I try to do that. You're making fun of yourself, but you're also being sincere at the same time thing, which is pretty tough. And a lot of people didn't understand it. Even I didn't totally understand it sometimes, but, but it was something that surprised people every time I think. And that was nice. So brought it back in podcast form basically because a, a, a friend of mine has a cat's podcast. She's like, no one's listening to it. Like, well, I can start a podcast that'll get you some, you'll, we'll co-host it. And then people will listen to our podcast and go listen to your cat's podcast. She said, okay. So <laughs> that's what I'm doing. So that's and it's doing, it's doing okay. Her cat's, her cat podcast is doing a lot better than it was. And our podcast is fun to do and it's doing fine, but it, it's purely for the fun of it. it, it mm -hmm. I have no aspirations of becoming the next Elroy's or whatever. Right. It's just at this point, it's do it if you enjoy it and if it takes off great. And if not, you, you're having fun anyway. So yeah, I, I feel you on that. It's uh, like th this, this show like largely started out of my like own need to like, you know, actually talk to humans <laughs> and uh, not, to, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I think podcast is a really great format for that. Um, and you've had a particularly lengthy career, like th in the conversation uh, 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 form format of podcasts, right? Podcasts can take on a lot of different forms. You know, there's like news shows and there's, um, you know, uh, sort of like skit shows kind of thing. Uh, but uh, you, you have made a career ta specifically talking about video games, um, mm. which is uh, very, very interesting. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you got into this business um, before Rev3, uh, before Destructoid, where did it really all uh, begin for you? Well, it's funny. Uh, man, I'm not used to getting interviewed. I'm usually, right. I just interviewed Drew to 51 and asked him like the same thing. He said it was playing badminton in high school in, in, in the snow is part of where he insp got inspired to make the kind of games he does. So I was like, that's Bananas. You can read that Nintendo Force. It's coming out next month. Hi. It's through the 51 issue. It's our 51st issue. So I always loved video games because they were the alternative to mainstream media. Essentially, growing up, I'm 44, so growing up, if you loved Nintendo and Super Nintendo and especially getting into uh, the PS1, which in our world people adore it and talk about growing up on it but this is before the internet this is before you could find anybody else who liked video games it was just me and like two other people that, that were willing to admit we liked video games and to do so you really had to accept like i'm not going to be a mainstream success i'm not going to be the, the normal guy that everyone wants to hang out with i'm i'm branding myself as sort of an outcast by admitting that I love Parappa the Rapper more than I do like Survivor or whatever. So I was just always like that. I went to art school and tried to like learn how to make games and do animation and comics and stuff and just never loved my own work enough to push it. And that's one of the things I respect so much about, about you and your team and so many other game devs is that you find a way to stay in love with your work and, and keep making it even though I know at times it's it's really grueling and it's easy to give up hope and easy to get bored, but you you're stuck with it uh, so many times now. It's really really impressive. But that wasn't me. I couldn't stick with that. But I'm super interested in other people, so I started um, trying to meet people who made games and talk to them about it and try to promote them on Destructoid, where I started writing in 2008, I think, and. Uh, I probably only got the job at Destructoid, come to think of it, is because I was on a reality show called uh, Road Rules, which is a show about talking to people, but also doing, like, games and stuff. Uh, but I had, like, my Capcom illustrations Japanese art book that I brought with me on Road Rules and all these stacks of EGM and stuff like that. So they were like, who is this guy? This is not what we thought we were getting out of our semi-jock style athletic real world rip off basically is what it was because right. i was just not into any of that stuff and i think they regretted casting me a little bit <laughs> but uh but i was on that and that you know was watched by millions of people and i went to greece because that was the 
the prize we won and I'm in Greece and getting people asking me for my autograph and stuff just because I was on some TV show, which was, you know, an amazing opportunity and stuff, but it wasn't any reflection of me having any mm. talent at all. I was just picked to talk and, and get filmed. There's, there's, it's no, no badge of uh, accomplishment really to be on a reality show in my opinion, but it was at a time when people were not yet used to the fact that just being famous doesn't mean you're talented. You know, in right. the 70s, you got on TV or in a movie, it must be because you're a good actor or a good musician or something. Come the 90s, a lot of people get on TV. And now, and this is what has not surprised me about what's happened with YouTube, you don't need to be talented at all to, to gain a, a cult of personality around you. You just need to be consistent and and strike a chord in some way with people and, and some would say that involves a talent to strike a chord but right. i don't know uh, that, that, that sometimes i'm not so sure um but maybe i'm just old and i don't get it i don't know right i think it's one of those things that like it's i think a talent is like defined by it's something that you can practice at and get good at and i think that like mm -hmm. cult of personality around quote unquote talentless people just still like like getting picked for a reality show just sort of happens you either like have that natural balance of like personality and whatever to 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 make that work or or not um and the the the, the culture around it um you know wanting that at the exact moment that it happens i so i think it's it is kind of hard to like say it's a talent like point blank because I don't know how you would get good at that if you wanted to. Um, yeah, that's a great point. I think, like we were saying, like I was kind of rambling about that. I think about it. If you keep doing it right. and saturate the world with you, then you're likely to succeed at it by getting attention. That doesn't mean you, quotes, got good at it, quotes. Uh, I, I don't think. I think that means you got attention. And getting attention and getting good are not necessarily same thing that said you know you can get better at speaking you can get better at mm -hmm. editing there's a lot of little craft points to it but from what i can tell some of the most finely crafted youtube videos or, or streams or whatever not half as popular as the garbagey ones that just strike a chord with people that, that get people upset and and therefore invested and therefore willing to come back and watch the next one and Actually, I don't know if we've ever talked about this. Do you know about the Karpman drama triangle? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> what? Oh, you're going to love it. I would not be surprised if you end up putting it in a game in some way. At some point. So it is a school of thought around how people react when they are either lacking empathy, a natural lack, or they're so scared that they can't feel empathy or so angry or just engaged in, in drama that's intense. And they, they call it the Cartman drama triangle for that reason. There's three points on the triangle. When you're embedded in this triangle, you see the world only the, this perspective of, of people being either victims, victimizers, or protectors. So you put right. yourself in one of these roles. Well, I feel victimized because... No, I, I watched a news show and they said that the, mm -hmm. the new president is coming after me. So now I feel victimized. Well, who's going to protect me? Oh, this YouTube guy. Well, he's the one fighting for my, my, my side against the victimizers who is you know, uh, liberals or whatever. And you get engaged in this concept of these three roles. They're very simple. And if you think about Star Wars, you think about Harry Potter, it's, you can classify every character in those stories as, as jumping around that triangle like luke starts off as a victim then he becomes uh, a protector you're afraid he's going to become a victimizer and then darth vader actually becomes a protector and like gets the the emperors the ultimate victimizer and blah blah, blah. so every like piece of, of of fiction that resonates with people uh, uses this triangle to tell its story and so does like all the most popular youtubers i can think of they they find a way to say i'm protecting so and so the gamers or whatever from the feminists or, you know, whatever cockamamie uh, concept they have at that time. And when people fall for it, I mean, QAnon, what the heck happened there? Mm -hmm. they, they bought into it, that there's these victims, secret victimizing celebrities and uh, elites, and it's only Trump that can save them, and now they're all freaking out. Right. 
<laughs> it's I, yeah. no, like it, it is a good triangle. Uh, I mean, from a from an uh, from a narrative perspective, if you were to be writing writing fiction or whatever, it is a good triangle to 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 definitely consider. Um, I mean, and the the only way I can t- the, the interesting thing about it is that the only way I can see avoiding self classification within it is to be removed from it and and just being like a, a pure um, inactive observer because to act in any way. Um, immediately puts you in one of the three roles. Um, other, so you just have like the only way to be outside of it is to be completely passive, which is like to be devoid of life at the same time. So, without, uh, there's, <laughs> so a, there's yeah. Right. Well, your your games, which I love, allow you to blur the lines and be like, well, I'm sort of victimizing, but I'm also sort of a victim at the same time, and I'm sort of protecting, like. Real life isn't as solid as those three roles. Like, right. I, I just victimized fans of terrible YouTubers by saying they have bad taste in, in video. So I'm the bad guy right now, but I'm also protecting people who those YouTubers attack. And I've been, uh, Gamergate was, was rough. <laughs> they really came after me. They hacked my bank account. All sorts oh, of Jesus. garbage happened. So you, you get in there, but you, if you're able to, to see the world in, in more than three colors, red, red, blue, and it's instead of black and white, I think of it as red, right. blue, and, and, and uh, yellow. Uh, as you see, the, uh, it's, we're a blend. All of us are blended all the time. And I also try to reframe them. So uh, I'm also a social worker. So I use this you know, triangle to, to help explain to people what they're going through and why their relationships are sometimes kind of messed up because they're dancing around in these, these three roles all the time. I'll say instead of thinking of yourself as a victim try to think of yourself as a creator and this is something you know all about because you've, you've created so much is you can't be a powerless victim while you have the power to create at the same time so it's really an antidote mm-hmm. for people who feel stuck in a in victim posture and likewise if you feel like attacking someone like victimizing instead of taking that aggressive destructive approach you take that energy and try to be constructive and and challenge people like i think you can do better instead of like you're the worst alexandra ocasio cortez and i get you these these guys i I think about them all the time unfortunately i i feel really disappointed with with other people who've taken a similar path as me but have gone such a such a venomous extreme with with their attacks on politicians they don't agree with but anyway uh to instead of attacking people challenge them and then likewise instead of protecting people you coach them. So instead of victim, victimizer, protector, it's uh, creator, uh, challenger, and coach. And sometimes it helps people uh, to take that energy and, and do something else with it. That's it's a, it's an interesting reframing of it. Um, I mean, so so I mean, we've we've definitely I think we've covered uh, some of the most significant ways in which um, games media has changed over uh the last you know five ten years um i i want to i want to know like we've gone over a quite a few of the mistakes we've adopted what do you think that the games media or the the landscape talking about games has done really right in in the recent history oh wow what what has changed for the better sure sure uh i think that i mean oof think about some of the stuff I wrote even eight or nine years ago mm-hmm. and we were coming off of video game magazines which I now write for one of those too so that's, that's sort of ironic but but video game magazines were just trying to ape the style of AAA marketing of the 90s and early 2000s which was a hundred percent misogynist ad boy like yeah. fart joke uh, John Kay, you know, Ren and Stimpy was, was so big in the 90s they felt like, oh, that's that's what we can do. We can be bad boys and, and be naughty and uh, it, it's it's obnoxious. And I, I look at my writing from 10 years ago and that, that was the culture of, of games blogging or whatever was to try to tell edgy jokes and be inappropriate and whatever. And I was in my late 20s, early 30s and it's sort of embarrassing, but, but that's how you did it right back then mm-hmm. and it's awful i'm so glad those days are over and and what seems to work now 
you are writing for a outlet that and support you and lend credibility to your voice because it's all about people weeding through whose voice is worth listening to, who is both authentic but also has a voice that is uh, relevant. And if you write for Polygon, you're automatically relevant. And you write for Kotaku, you're automatically relevant in a lot of people's minds. Whereas if you write for other blogs, no matter how good your blog is, people are going to be like, oh, well, that blog, that brand isn't relevant, so forget about it. But if you write for Polygon, and thank God Polygon has done, I think, a good job a lot of the time lifting up voices that are, are filled with hope that video games can be a vessel for empathy and getting to know yourself and getting to know the developers and not like with a lot of bullshit and, and reading through like sure this game's a power fantasy but we can enjoy it and also criticize it at the same time like that that kind of stuff didn't really exist 10 years ago as far as i recall if you wrote one of those those blogs no one read it you know, right. that, that did not get the hits what got the hits was the now making fun of how metal gear solid has new ass jiggle physics or something like that got a thousand right. thousand uh comments but you know oh i wonder if, if there's actually feelings embedded in this game eh tossed aside so so the progressives kind of won in some ways when it came to the writing part of of game journalism but when it comes to the video part it did not <laughs> something about Something about video and kind of like hateful, mm -hmm. anti-empathy, uh, in-group versus out-group nonsense that just does so great on, on YouTube. I don't know why. And, and anyone the, I've seen try to make like compassion, feel-good videos, mm, it's never the, really it's takes the, off. Uh, very, uh, very rare. The barrier to entry via patience. You know, it takes so long to read an article mm. <laughs> versus... Uh, oh. <laughs> Well, yeah, I thought about that. And, and you have a very text-heavy game, so you know the people who are attracted to your games are willing to read. And, and to read takes a lot of empathy. Oh, yeah. You I'm, need to be empathetic in order to, to fill in all the blanks and really picture yourself being in the place of somebody else based just on words and simple pictures. Whereas if you're not so empathetic, you can watch a video of an angry guy saying we need to beat up the other guys and and totally get it just totally get on board with that guy um yeah it's it's I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I, I completely agree with you like the 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 way we talk about games and the things that we focus on has definitely shifted to a little there's a, a little bit more intellectual than it was um mm -hmm. in the in the mid late 2000s a little bit more um introspective um uh but also I still think that the ass physics jiggle, uh, ass jiggle physics uh, <laughs> article would get the top trending on today's page. Like no question has there like, while the articles are being written about, um, you know, thoughtfulness or whatever, um, the, the readership, you know, that, that, that lizard brain that drives us to like click on these things, you know, is still permanently present. Um, yeah. And, and also present, and this is related to that, is I'm not going to read about some indie game. Like, oh my god, that is so much worse mm -hmm. than it used to be. When I was doing Subhomes, it was coming off of Indie Game the movie, which I was actually in for like 45 seconds, which really helped me out, weirdly enough, because so many people watch that. There was this moment that you were a part of, and are still a part of, as, as it's moved forward and evolved, but it's not the same, as you know. 2000. 13, 14, 15, and there was this romanticism about indie games, and people said, I want to learn about a new indie game today. I don't know why. I, I, I used to have a theory about it, but I'm not sure if I even buy it anymore. These days, it's got to be you're talking about AAA or no one's listening, you know, yeah. or it's a, an indie that bubbled up somewhere like uh stardew valley or among us or something that nobody talked about it did not get where it was going because it, it ended up getting a lot of attention from blogs it got attention on its own through streamers and through various other other means and then the bloggers can write about it and and mm -hmm. people will read it but it, it's not the other way around anymore like you just can't can't write about an indie game in order to help it blow up it just doesn't doesn't work right there's a lot of um 
obsession over that that that, that idea of relevance or or success mm -hmm. um uh, you know it's by yeah by the time i see um an indie game that i've become aware of from you know just being in the circles that i'm in um by the time it hits a, a, a mainstream blog you know it's already achieved you know hundred thousand sales status uh you know it's it's uh it's it's got multiple platform deals it's got you know it's so so then i guess on, on i guess a, pro a professional question for the developers who might be interested in knowing like what value does it have if you're a completely unknown indie developer reaching out to press is it even do you think it's even worth it anymore yeah i think so uh because from what i can tell uh, the way it still works there's in in business there's this bell curve and and forgive me for butchering this because i haven't talked about it in a few years but there's a, a curve in terms of how well known you are and it starts with the enthusiasts so you get mm -hmm. like a few hundred enthusiasts to know who you are who are considered relevant and credible and once they're talking about you and the influencers know about you. So those are people that aren't considered quite as credible and authentic uh, as the, the, the first group, the, the real enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a real enthusiast, part of the badge of honor of being in it just because you love it is that you're, you're also not very popular. <laughs> if you're a popular, people will think, oh, you're in it because you're popular. But, you know, frankly, uh, I hate to toot my own horn on this. When I recommend games to people they know i'm not just trying to follow a bandwagon because I'm, I'm off the bandwagon and I'm, I'm not trying to become the next big thing anymore so they know oh he must really mean it and that that has influenced from what i've been told streamers and and some youtubers and some other folks say oh well this guy who's been doing this for 12 years says this game has something to it and he wrote all these articles like i a college professor wrote me the other day uh and got me in touch with one of students who who wrote a book and asked if i could be quoted on the back of the book to, to review it a little bit and i was like sure i'm not what's hot right now though you know that he's like yeah no i grew up reading all your wii reviews from 10 years ago and then i became a phd and now i teach some of your reviews from 10 years ago like it's you never know what's going to happen so sorry my long-winded point so uh, first the the real enthusiasts then the influencers and then the mainstream and then like Oprah, and then your grandpa finally gets around to be like, "Oh, I heard about Minecraft. It was yes. that was a hoot." You know, it's it's way past it. It reaches that saturation point. But Minecraft's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I got talked about just by enthusiasts for like a few years. Mm -hmm. and then the, the 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 influencers got a hold of it, and then the mainstream, who cares about what the influencers say, blew it up, and they got marketing deals, and it. it became popular because it was popular and sort of became a self-perpetuating thing and it has since sort of tapered off but now everyone everyone knows what it is or you, and you, it, it all starts with the little guys you and you absolutely are right about that um enthusiast badge of honor um we, we started actually a minecraft server late last year and there was absolutely a lengthy conversation about like who had had the beta the longest um before <laughs> before um we had all jumped in and um you know yeah. it, it's it's definitely real so but i mean tying it back to like uh, i guess professional advice um would you suggest then not focusing on you know the top tier ba bandwagoners like grandpa and oprah obviously but like even skipping that <laughs> mid-tier? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I would go to the first two tiers and don't spend a lot of money trying to convince them of anything. But try to find... First of all, like, when you send out your press emails, um, it's, mm, this is tough. You send codes in them, they're just going to use them and not mm -hmm. review your game. That, that, you probably know that already. Putting GIFs in your emails really, really helps because when you're going to write about a game, can't tell from a screenshot if it's going to be something that's going to interest um, readers. You need to see it in motion. So just embedding a little GIF in there so you can look at it for two or three seconds and just get a sense of, of whether this is the kind of thing that's going to interest readers. Because that's what a, any anyone writing about a video game uh, needs to think to themselves am I interested enough in this to write about it and say something authentic and interesting? 
And are the readers going to be interested in it? Unless it's both, you're you're going to skip it and, and write about something else. So you want to try to explain briefly why the readers are going to care about this. And it, like, let's say if I was pitching Among Us right now, if I was trying to market Among Us, I'd be like, so oh, when was the last time you knew exactly who you could trust? When's the last time you, you knew for sure that you weren't about to get sick when you left the house? Been a year? We've got a game about that. Right. You have no idea. Whenever you play this game, you never, never know who's going to stab you in the back and end up. And and, end up, and I think that's part of why that game has done so well. Actually, it was just in the right place in the right time for the pandemic, sort of pandemic the game in some ways. So uh, to try to to get that angle going, but not doing it in a way that makes you sound inauthentic, which is really hard. And like I was talking about with you you have managed to remain engaged and get feeling from your work even after you worked on it forever and ever, which is which is an amazing feat. You have to try to put that same feeling in whatever press materials you put out there because right. otherwise you're just gonna sound like marketing speak and it's it's just as bad as as trying to pick somebody up at a bar and say you know, like you'd get lost in your eyes or whatever. Like it, it, you, you, you can't do the, the pat marketing speak. You, you get so much of it that it's just like white noise at this point. Right. Um, and, and then in terms of like, if you are a new developer, how do you even begin to build these, the awareness of contacts that would be relevant? Like, how do you find that two tier? Like the enthusiasts, I think are just people in the game circles players largely are enthusiasts but then how do you find um that like second tier of journalists people who um might even be interested and build your contact list if you were starting from the ground up sure i mean the creator of transylvania adventure of simon quest which is a game that uh i've been following for a while I think he just reached out to me on Twitter and was like, Hey, I heard you like old games. Do you like this? Like to, to, to individualize it and parasocialize it for, for whatever creepy as that might sound. But try not to be fake again. If you can, if you can find writers and YouTubers and whatever it is, you genuinely like their work and their personality. And you think it's a fit for whatever working on if you think they're going to like your your project just reach out to them individually and be like hey uh you're working right now and i get that but i actually like your work and it's a little bit of just humanity i want to give to you by saying do you want to look at this thing i made maybe you'll like it mm -hmm. and and then from there you can end up really keeping that connection going but on the other hand ever since gamergate Every video game blogger, journalist, whatever I know, is deathly afraid of coming across as biased towards the developer because, really, for the developer, like the right. developers get a reputation for like being in bed with the journalists. Um, you'll you'll get your bank accounts hacked and whatnot. So it's a very it's a very fine line. But but I guess. To, to to treat people like individuals and to give them a little bit of yourself as a human being is my, my general advice. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty solid advice. Um, and, and I mean, is, is there anything apart from just reading a ton of games media uh, articles and stuff to find the, the voices that we can, because obviously like it's pretty well known that it's a bad practice to just send your stuff to everybody because there'll be a lot of wasted time. Um, mm. and a lot of no, re no response if it's not, you know, like personalized or, um, focused. Um, but where do the, where's the watering hole? Where do the game journalists hang out? How do, how do we, <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, they are afraid to hang out again. Yeah. Because, um, so many of them got attacked for being in cahoots or whatever. And they also don't like each other. Like most of the time, like it is, it's a competitive they, scene. <laughs> It is competitive, jealous, desperate, uh, self-loathing. Like, this is games in general, unfortunately. There's two groups. There's the group that's in it because they're so empathetic that Sonic the Hedgehog makes them cry or whatever, and they just have so many feelings about it. And they love the developers, and they love people, and they, 
but there's oftentimes a little bit of a block that allows them to, to there's something blocking them from engaging in a regular way. And for some reason, video games is a better vessel for their, for their um, empathy and their connection with others. So there's that group. And then there's the group that just hates people, just only loves games and plays games because it's a way to escape from people and to pretend that they're killing people and whatever. So it's it's a completely, there's never been, and it's such a microcosm of just the world in general, right? Like so many people said that Gamergate was the preview of what was going to happen with the, the Trump presidency and how Trump got elected because the games world is this heightened microcosm of, of the two extremes uh, in the world in general, um, two extreme groups. So the watering hole, I think that the best way is to start with one and then ask about another one. So there's a game developer actually who I wrote about his games because I thought they looked really cool. But then he reached out to me and thanked me. And I said, no problem. You know, it's not personal. I'm not your friend. I just like your games. It's like, oh, that's great. Can I ask you a question though? Do you know any other developers who'd be interested in this or any, any, um, any, writers and youtubers like oh yeah I, I know the completionist i know a couple of other people i can put you in touch with them because i think your game looks good not because i'm your friend right. like oh okay yeah we're not friends that's cool friend yeah. and we're secretly friends but you know we we pretend they're not so it's so funny what happened uh and now now they have a big job in the industry they actually um i didn't help them get their games covered right. so much but i did connect them with other developers and now now they're they're making huge, hugely popular games, and the the press is coming to them like begging for exclusives and stuff like that. And I get to sit back and be like, I helped make that game get made in a way because I connected that guy to that guy. And now I can't write about it because if they find out, I'm going to be called uh, you know an unethical person for liking a game by someone I also like as a person. I guess that's unethical. Man, oh sorry. That's I don't make the rules, man. Like. Sorry. <laughs> I know, but if you like Tom Cruise as a person, you're still allowed to write his review his movies. Right. Like how many, how many Hollywood reporters like? Well, I hate all celebrities, and I'm not interested in them as people, but I watch their movies without any bias and coldly right. assess them. It doesn't happen. Right. We're all hobnobbing at the Oscars and whatnot. It do goes. You, do you think that like uh, that that standard has like? or that expectation of the reading public has kind of like changed. Do you, do you take less joy in the job at all now or, um, uh, I mean, I just don't, if I were to really want to make it, you know, like I'm going to be one of those game bloggers who's making 200,000 a year and paying for my health insurance with it. I wouldn't have fun with it because it's so right. audience can turn on you at any time. And, like I was saying, that's part of why I think things changed after 2014, 2015. Um, you didn't feel like you were allowed to like the people who made the things you made anymore, or else people will, will try to hack your bank account for liking people and, and create YouTube videos about how you're a bad person and a bad journalist because you like people. So that took a lot of the fun out of getting to know indie developers and... Um, Oh, Frank, so unfortunately, some people that were on subholms got attacked just for being on subholms because they thought it was unethical to talk to me on that show. And me clearly being like, I think you're a great person. You sacrificed your whole life to make this game. That's so cool. Well, that's unethical, though. So now you're getting hate mail. So I see. it's part of what soured the whole deal. I hate to say the terrorists won. <laughs> didn't, but... Uh, they they did score a few points, I think. As a, as a developer, at least now I understand why nobody likes me. It's just because they like my games too much. <laughs> could, be, could be true. Could be true. You're, uh, and you're also someone who did. Uh, you, didn't you travel across the country? I did. Yes, that was games? that was a thing I did. Amazing. I yes. I, so I, I mean, I did, on on that tie, I do have some interesting. I have some questions about that for you. I mean, not about that, but um, yes, I I did a long road trip, uh, traveled around in America for about a year, interviewing uh, game journalists, and and I wanted to ask you because you are a person who is very experienced talking with game developers, um, and this is more of like a life question. But how do you personally navigate conversations with people who know a lot about a subject that you know nothing about? <laughs> 
Well, it happens a lot. Uh, not only when it comes to me talking to, to game developers, but in, in my regular life too. I'm lucky I talk to people who know a lot about stuff I know nothing about. And to remain, I mean, listening, as you, as you might know, actually takes any steps. If I remember correctly, there's five steps to listening. There's just paying attention, checking the information as you're getting it for understanding and validity. So while you're talking, I'm checking like, I know what he means or do I not know what he means or can I relate this to something else? Shutting yourself up so you don't start talking, like quieting your own voice uh, in there in, in the process because when you when you really listen, you can't be planning your next statement. You need to be in that moment with the person, um, in, engage with them. And then uh, as you're doing that, you have to try to actively make sure you're recording information uh into your brain so it's not just going in one in in one ear and out the other and then eventually you have to get ready to to prepare to to show them you were listening by planning to reflect back what you heard to them so i think i had those steps right five steps of listening way harder than talking talking you just need to look in your own brain notice what's in there and try to put it to words but listening much more complicated process so trying to get good at listening, realizing it's a skill that you can practice at, a talent, if you will, like we yeah, were talking about. Right. And to really focus, I think, on that reflecting step. So if you are ready, if you're preparing yourself at the whole time, like I am listening to this person and preparing my own version of what they're saying to give back to them. So what do I need to do that? I need to make sure I understand it. I need to, um, you know, check it for validity, check to make sure that blah, 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 and, and all those other steps I talked about, and then reflect back. And reflecting is actually the most effective way to show someone that you listened and build empathy with them. So many, many times uh, on subhomes or whatever, nervous, uh, caring, and interesting person, but socially awkward and anxious. That's why they got into games, you know, programming is so much simpler than dealing with the, the ambiguity and mushiness of real social interactions near some strange guy on a webcam. And this is before, you know, we were all on Zoom calls and Skype calls all the time. It's a big deal to be streaming video. And then there's going to be an audience, so they're all nervous. So I just say, so tell me, tell me what it was like growing up. What kind of video games did you play? I played Castlevania, I played Mario Brothers. Castlevania and Mario Brothers, those are good ones. And like those two and there's this little spark of like oh this is going to be okay this person's listening to me and they get me and i can they're inviting me into their in-group and vice versa so now i can let my guard down a little bit and just talk to them and the more you just reflect back what you hear from them still trying to add a little bit so you just don't like a stereotypical therapist who does nothing back but mm -hmm. do nothing but but pair it back um you can you can really get people to to wake up and be alive with you and you also learn a lot more from them if you force yourself to reflect because when you say something yourself you remember it when you listen you don't remember but whatever i say i'm going to remember later you unfortunately <laughs> i'm going to remember a little bit but we remember the things that we say that's how our brains are, are wired um, so, I mean, using this, like, I mean, a weird, it, it almost sounds like two AIs talking about how humans talk, but um, <laughs> when, uh, you know, employing this, I guess, interview tactic, we'll call it, uh, you know, sure. uh, um, but is totally applicable to normal everyday life. Um, mm -hmm. What has this opened up to, into your life? Um, having so many conversations with so many people um of wildly different talents what has it added to your life uh oh geez i mean it's my favorite thing uh i'm also like i was saying a social worker where i just listen to people um i have i i have a lot of social energy and i have a lot of creative energy but it's not kind that has driven me to make anything that i care about that much draw comic strips for the for nintendo force magazine too i never like them I'll spend like 12, 15 hours on one and be like, this stinks. Well, it's got to go to print. And I just send it out. And I've drawn, I don't know, 18 of them or something. I'm not really getting any better, no matter how much I practice. I just don't have the talent. Um, so I like to create, even though it's not that good. 
I love to create a good conversation. I love to create a space where I can find out more about other people and step into their shoes. Like I was saying, interviewing Suda51, I actually interviewed him on my birthday. Oh my God, stretch it one second. And take me out. Oof. Good guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he's, he wants to eat already, but it's, it's not even eight. Um, stepping into his shoes is... I've stepped into his shoes through playing his video games so many times. And every time I play his games, I think about what was he thinking when he made this? It's really, for me, a way to try to step into his subconscious and play around in it. So kind of broadcast his dreams. Uh, Dreamcast them, if you will. Well, yeah, he's going to make some noise again. And I get to uh, jump in there and, and learn about his subconscious. The same thing being a social worker, being a therapist, working with a, a patient who's like floridly psychotic. They're just broadcasting their dreams for you and you get to to find out what their subconscious is doing through them telling you about their hallucinations and delusions and whatnot so it's what i love about video games it's what i love talking about people i mean talking to people and it's um something that just feels like it's the point of life for me i found the meaning of life and that's uh getting to know the other people on earth while we're all here together and, and we'll die but until then get to get to know them and it's a real privilege yeah that's really really great um oh thanks no it's uh it's something that i definitely like i mean i i i recognize and, and uh enjoyed thoroughly that's um when i was a journalist is having good conversations about um passions you know like mm. uh that was part of what i what i set out for um when i when i did my independent journalism um, was to figure out what drove the passion of creators because it was something that like seemed very, very far away from me and it w really helped me um, to kind of come and understand my own passions um, uh, by hearing hearing the uh, stories of others. Um, but there's also this other side where, um, you know, there's there's enjoying these conversations about the, pa the passions that developers have and then there's like the reader side, the the game player side, the the fan side, and I want to I want to get your impression of like where do you think, um, what is the difference in the passions that developers and players have? Uh, where do they cross over? Where do they contrast? Um, because I, I I'm curious to hear your take on it because you've you've had so many interviews and you've you've read so, written so much more for the players than. Um, oh sure 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 yeah i mean it, a lot of it has to do with what stage of development you're in uh psychology again so eric erickson you probably heard of him he, he he devised he went around and just talked to people like how you did and how i like to do and he took notes on what people's struggles were what their goals were what their fears were at whatever stage uh, of age they were in so and then he started grouping them all together and came up with this concept that people are, are generally moving through their life and go through a set of eight stages in terms of what their their win state and their lose state is. And it's all video game related. Like video games are such a reflection of just the way our brains work. I, I can't even can't even begin to start on that one because we're almost out of time. But um yeah, what was I saying? Yes. So players are usually in uh, who are really just die hard into escaping into video games all the time. Like people who are playing video games four or five, six hours a day. They're usually in identity versus role confusion, uh, which comes before intimacy versus isolation. And you can hear it right there in, in those, those terms that identity versus role confusion. Well, I don't know who I am. Life mm -hmm. fucking sucks. Pardon my French. I can pretend to be this video game character for a while. I know who they are. The pro conflict solved. I know who I am. I feel comfortable. I feel connected. I feel like I can can breathe when I'm just playing this game instead of being whoever I am in, in my regular identity. You see so much of that on the internet. And after that is intimacy versus isolation. So after you figure out who you are, then you figure out how can I connect with other people. And connecting with people is really scary. Intimacy is terrifying. Intimacy in a video game, though. I played Fall Guys for three hours, and I felt connected to all those people I was bumping into and falling down with and whatever. Or 
or among us, oh, we work together and we worked out our fears and, and mistrust about the imposter and it, we turned it into a joke that nobody trusts anybody anymore. Oh, that was fun. Um, and, and that's, that's generally what they're after, uh, that uh, sort out their issues around role confusion and sold out their issues around intimacy versus isolation. Again, that's why YouTubers are so popular. They're your virtual friends, VTubers. Uh, truly virtual friends. It's a cartoon avatar that you feel like is your new buddy. Um, developers, on the other hand, if they're going to get anything done, they're in the next stage, which is generativity versus stagnation. And they just want to get their goddamn game finished. <laughs> That's all. They, they're, they're just so desperate to, to be able to have created something to really give to people. And it, it's, it's very different goals. It's very different values. Um, I'll write about a developer who I admire because of how you know i try to make stuff all the time too and i admire this developer for who made this massive game and the audience is like huh well who do i get to be in the game oh a guy well what's special about the guy nothing oh well i'm out you know i don't care that it took them huh. eight years to make i want to know about who i get to be and how i get to connect with other people in this game the fact that it is a, a labor of love and a and an artistic achievement and blah 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 that that's all just nonsense uh, buzzwords to to people who are are really asking them the asking themselves this question all the time and who am i and how do i connect with others um you, you can't impress them with the generativity versus stagnation stuff huh that actually that's a that is a lot of insight into like if 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 a develop like I to understand how, what a player is going to be drawn to, um, you know, f figuring these things out, man, I I, I never because because you're absolutely right. Like when I'm in the mode of I'm making my game, I'm literally just focused on like, you know, accomplishing some technical feat that I have put in front of myself or, um, you know, getting to some milestone that I've imaginary milestone that I've set up or or whatever whatever. Um, very seldom. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm sure better developers do consider what is the player looking for in their game? Um, <laughs> well, you allow people to play with those questions so friggin' well in your games. Uh, your games are all about full confusion and, and intimacy versus isolation, trying to connect with significant other, connect with the world. Uh, so impressed with your your games i feel a little silly talking about myself again so much because like i'm talking to you the guy who made the game or, or worked with your team and made the game that how, how how long was the script in your last game uh i think the last one a million well i mean it's just been like a lot of updates but about a million words um it's <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting because uh like i think about asm and like uh, uh my own passions at the time is i think partially also driven by that um identity and and role definition um stage role you know confusion. role confusion right like uh to 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 place my stake i am a game developer right i'm not i'm not just a player um uh versus i think i think my second game was absolutely more uh generative versus stagnation um Mm. not not to not to go all therapist couch on this session but you're reflecting um, like crazy right now you're making me feel so listened to it's wild um did yeah. the fancy words there generativity versus stagnation Very um lovely. well it, it, it no it's, it, it, they, they sink it's it's it, it works uh it, it it makes sense um so okay if we're like gamers aside developers aside what's the next stage sure. where are we going Oh, <laughs> that's uh, um, integrity versus despair. Uh -huh. That's when you look back and you're done and you're like, man, so, you know, I'm, I'm 70. I'm not going to have any more kids. I'm not going to work anymore. It's all about whether I'm proud of what I did or whether I have nothing but despair and regret and, and remorse and, and trauma and, and grief. Or do I feel proud? And and so, you know, sometimes I counsel people in their old age, and you never want to be like, so what's next for you? What are you planning on doing next week? You know, it's like, what are you doing now? And how do you feel about what you've done? Really, I, I think you have a lot to, to be proud of, don't you think? And probably not be that leading uh, in your uh, 
conversation style, but, you know, try to move towards that, like be framing around how oh, you have that many grandkids. That's amazing. And they love you. That's great. Instead of focusing on, oh, I, I lost um, my home or lost blah, 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 stuff that makes people feel powerless. You want to allow people to be connected to that and empathize with them and sit there if they want to. But if you see that it's just re-traumatizing them, then it's time to try to reframe and, and uh, reflect and then move up. Oh, sorry, for my computer. Uh, reflect and then pivot towards something that's a, that's a strength. That's also true to allow them to feel better. So yeah, the last stage is integrity versus despair. And some of us are already hitting it. I, I think I have a little ways to go, thankfully. I, I you know, uh, unabashed progressive, I don't know, political, it's good to be on the show, but I'm so excited about uh, Trump just being in despair now. Like all his integrity is gone. He's getting impeached again. Just wanting to learn that he sucked and that he's gonna, he's gotta stop it. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping. I mean, he's probably gonna find a way to be proud of himself no matter what he does. That's right. how it works when you're a malignant narcissist type guy, but um, it'll be really neat if he if he has enough to spare in order to say like, I'm sorry, and I won't do that again. That would, that would be really good for him. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um... I'm 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 th- I'm gonna think a lot about the that final stage or the next stage. I don't I, again. I, I don't know if I'm 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 entering integrity versus despair yet. I've had I think I've had a couple thoughts in the back of my mind that are in that wheelhouse, but not quite. I don't think I'm out of generation versus stagnation yet. Um, yeah, I don't think so. It'll be, I mean, you just it'll put, be out, a minute. put on the you put out a, a dog golfing game. Your company did. We did. We put out three ball. games this year, man. That was brutal. <laughs> I was I was so because I know how long ASM took and was hoping you didn't reach that that sense of exhaustion where where it was hard to move forward and then instead you put out the the Karen simulator yep. and and uh, doggone golfing and uh, what was the third game? Some, sometimes oh, always ASM. monsters, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Same, yeah. yeah. Incredible. Um, but yeah, man, uh, it, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. And I, I, I know we got to let you go because uh, you've got another appointment coming <laughs> up relatively soon. Busy yeah, I'm going to be on a podcast that reviews kids bop songs. <laughs> so I'm also on a podcast with some friends of mine. Again, they're like, oh, you've got sort of an audience. Um, we do a podcast to... to... It... <laughs> they wanted to make a sitcom about me being an old talk show host a washed up talk show host called silky wilkins they spent like thousands of dollars and shot a pilot then they didn't like it so now they're like now we need to start a podcast in order to get you famous so then we can make the pilot with with fun so uh, so many schemes people got but i they're all my friends so i'm willing to do it so we we have another show called uh worst song on earth it's a podcast where we review music and only the songs we think are really bad. I just did um, a Jimmy Buffett song called Math Sucks, I think is a real, real stinker. Um, uh, and to promote that show, now I'm going to be on another show that reviews kids pop um, songs. Amazing. <laughs> so I, just, I just show up and hope for the best. Worst song is covering kids. Oh, yeah. J- uh, Jason Signs Argonauts just asked, Worst song is covering kids pop. No, it sounds like these are two separate. <laughs> Two separate things, yeah. The 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 worst song on earth. They're on on Twitter and Spotify and all that. The other one, let me make sure I have the name right. Child's Child's Play Cast. They're called. That's the Kids Bop Review Podcast. So they they're recording with me in just a few minutes. I've got a, a Zoom call and and talk about the the Kids Bop version of oops i did it again i'm, I'm volunteering that as the worst kids bop song it's, it's, i it's, mean um, subject matter um <laughs> it's frankly sexual yeah and it's children so you know, you lose that well, round. Yeah, I, I i will leave you to it then thank you so much for coming on it has been a blast catching up i think we've actually learned a, a lot not just how to um deal with press as developers but also how to have good conversations you know and uh, i really appreciate that i hope so yeah i had so much fun talking to you and sorry if that gets you hate mail from someone that no i worries. like you as a human being but i do you're 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 an astounding uh, interesting amazing person i'm really flattered that you had me on the show 
Cheers, likewise. All right, gang, I'm going to send you away now. Uh, I think we're going to go see Pumpkin Days. She's learning Blender, so it'll be fun to watch her uh, make 3D models. Um, see you all tomorrow, gang.